Good afternoon. My name is Iris Palmer, and I'm Deputy Director for Community Colleges here at New America. Thank you all so much for joining us today to discuss this important topic of community colleges and career and technical education preparing learners for the post-pandemic economy. I particularly want to thank Caroline for agreeing to moderate, all of our panelists for agreeing to participate, and the ECMC Foundation for their support for not only this, this um, webinar, but also for our work in general. At, um, at community colleges today, we're seeing an unprecedented drop in enrollment in the wake of the pandemic. Uh, and we're really seeing this more than any other sector in higher education. Recent research has indicated that hands-on career and technical education programming have been driving much of this drop, particularly for men and even more specifically for men of color. This drop is really troubling because these programs are exactly what we need to help people reconnect to the labor market in jobs that can lead to family sustaining careers. And as community colleges see their enrollments drop, they get less funding, which leads to further erosion of the capacity of these key institutions to serve the people that need them most. That's why I'm so excited to have this conversation today. We're going to hear how colleges and philanthropic leaders are thinking about um, this role of community colleges going into the future and how policymakers are thinking about addressing some of the challenges for community colleges connecting to the post pandemic world. Caroline, I'm really happy to turn it over to you. Thank you so much, Irish. I'm really excited to be here. Uh, I'm uh, welcome to this new America webinar. I'm Caroline Hendry. I'm the executive director of the Education Writers Association. EWA is the National Professional Organization of Journalists who cover education. I'll be moderating our conversation about CTE Beyond High School, specifically the role of community colleges in helping learners develop the academic and technical know-how they need to move into or upward in the job market. Well, we know that the pandemic has forced everyone in the community college sector to make wrenching adjustments. But as widespread as the disruption has been, it's looked and felt different depending on where you sit. If you're a college president, you may be heart sick over enrollment losses, even as you work furiously to offer students the learning experiences they deserve. If you're a CTE researcher, you may be working just as furiously to understand how policies at the federal, state, and local levels can best be used to advance students, workers, employers, and the economy. If you're a CTE funder, you may be focused on leveraging this moment to produce a collective shift in the perception and the reality of CTE pathways. And if you're a student trying to complete a course of study to secure a credential with real career value, you just may find yourself with a dream deferred. Today's speakers come to the conversation with just those kinds of diverse experiences. And that's good because CTE Beyond High School has only grown in importance and complexity during the pandemic. So now in alphabetical order, here's a bit of background on each of today's speakers. Dr. Pam Edinger has served in what she prefers to call the community college movement for more than 25 years. Since 2013, she's been president of Bunker Hill Community College, the largest of 15 community colleges in Massachusetts. Among her honors was being named by the Obama White House in 2016 as a champion of change. Jean-Christophe Sacqui, who goes by JC, is a student in the manufacturing program at Dallas College's Richland campus in Texas. He's also an employee of the college where he works as a specialist in the school's manufacturing lab. So he has an unusual dual perspective on how CTE in community colleges has been impacted by the pandemic. Peter J. Taylor, is the president of ECMC Foundation, 
In this role, he's led more than $225 million in grants and investments, primarily related to the college success and career readiness of underserved populations. As a speaker and author, he focuses on the role of CTE in closing the skills gap and the need to break down the stigma that holds back CTE and its students. Lul Tesfai is a senior policy advisor with the Center on Education and Labor at New America. There, she conducts research and analysis related to the education and training models, workforce development, and worker protections. Her past positions include a stint as Director of Policy in the Office of Career, Technical, and Adult Education in the U.S. Department of Education. So, Peter, I would like to start with a question for you. Today is the last day of February, which is Black History Month, of course, and is also CTE Month. Peter, you've written that this month, and I quote, is a great time to emphasize the importance of equity-driven CTE and to acknowledge the complicated history many African Americans have with technical education programs. Could you please help us better understand what you mean by equity-driven CTE and why it's important? Well, let me start, uh, uh, Caroline, and uh, thank you for having me today. Talk a little bit about that complicated history because it does influence what we do today to try to bring more students of color into the CTE field. For the longest time, as you well know, uh, CTE programs were considered the track that people went on uh, when they were academic underachievers. And it was really unfortunate because it gave the field a little bit of a stigma that the highest and best use of your skills was to go to a four-year route while somehow denigrating those who chose to work with their hands and learn by doing, um, who maybe didn't thrive in traditional academic settings. And as a result, uh, we've seen not enough young people of color enter these fields because they've heard a mantra over and over and over again that it's really not the best path to go. When in fact, I think we can all agree that a young person who goes out and gets a two-year associate's degree, uh, becomes a plumber, starts a small business, employs people, is really just as valuable a contributor to the well-being of his and her, or, or her community as somebody who goes and gets a four-year degree. So uh, part of it is kind of erasing that stigma. And I think particularly for, for communities of color, you have seen the CTE courses being overwhelmingly represented, particularly in the skilled trade space, by, uh, by, by you know, traditionally Caucasian uh, communities, male dominated. Um, these are great fields where people can in fact thrive. I, I remember going to a motorcycle repair program in Florida about four or five years ago. And the, the teacher said, you know, I love it when women come to this program, women's hands are smaller and they do a better job because they can get in and fix things better. What a great opportunity for a young woman to, to pursue and really thrive in that field. So um, to me, you know, equity, you've got to think about some of the research around how uh, young people are messaged and where they're steered and really the good outcomes that can come about. We've spent a lot of money, Caroline, focusing on single mothers and their educational journeys. Um, CTE is the perfect track for many of them, whether it be in the healthcare field, skill trades, culinary, where they can get a decent job, earn a family sustaining wage and, and, and take themselves out of poverty. And, and in fact, some research we sponsored through uh, the Institute for Women's Policy Research shows women who get that CTE certificate, half as likely to end up in poverty as single parents uh, than those who actually get that one or two year uh, education at a community college. So there's a strong case to be made for focusing on equity gaps by focusing on CTE. Absolutely, thank you. Um, I'd like to turn now to uh, Pam, and we, you know, Iris had mentioned the enrollment declines and the relationship to uh, CTE. So, as we know, higher ed has been consumed with the issue of enrollment declines during the pandemic, with community colleges particularly hard hit. Could you explain how enrollment issues have been playing out specifically during COVID at the college that you had? Of course, um, and, and thank you for, for your invitation for me to join you today. Um, 
with our community colleges, with a number, I mean, all of the community colleges around the country, right? There's about 1,200 of us. Um, those of us who are in urban community colleges on either coast are experiencing this. The drop in, um, in student population is disproportionately affecting men of color, particularly Black men, and in more particular uh, studies, young Black men. Um, it is, it is to me, um, one of the crises that's not only born of COVID, but in the way that we have treated the, um, our, our, our population of uh, people of color in higher education period. They are the most vulnerable because our systems aren't built for them. Um, our systems are built for a population that we recognized 50 years ago, traditional students, first two years of a four-year college. So we don't think about what is it that our, let's say young black men see as um, barriers. Well, they're policy oriented. They are the way that they are welcomed or not welcomed into, into our higher ed community. And, and simply the questions we ask, the way that we treat them. What COVID has done is it has devastated our communities of color. Um, in, in, in K-12 education, in healthcare, in transportation, in childcare, in housing, all the things that forms what I call a safety net around folks who are vulnerable. And because higher education is, it's, it's almost a kind of luxury uh, for our communities of poverty and communities of color, we're the first to go, right? If you are graduating out of high school and you're, you're, you're living in very cramped quarters, and your family begins to get sick or you get sick, all of those things that makes the safety net begins to disintegrate. And because of that historical lack in the community, it contributes to this population decline. And we are now scrambling to figure out how to repair that, um, that, that, that net. But we're also very conscious that we want not just a recovery, but we want a just and equitable recovery. So we can't just build things back in the crappy way it used to be, right? You can't have the same, the same social safety net that was never safety in the first place. Mm -hmm. So we're being mindful. And CTE is, I think, a part of that solution in that the STEM fields and of course the trades, um, but also the new emerging fields, things like clean energy, um, what we call white, uh, not, not white collar, not blue collar, but new collar jobs um, in IT, in cybersecurity, all of those things. But we need to be careful that we don't build the skill base in such a way that it becomes a second class citizen again. Right. right. To right. whatever CTE. We don't want an underclass of CTE workers. So, you know, learn how to code in a month. And then that's all you know is how to code for a month. Um, right. And it doesn't stack into anything else. So that we're paying a lot of attention to that. Right. Well, thank you. I, I do want to turn to our, the student on our panel now, JC. Uh, as we discussed, you're a student seeking an associate's degree in advanced manufacturing, and you're a specialist in your school's manufacturing lab. So you felt the impact of COVID-related enrollment changes up close and personal. Uh, can, what can you share with us about what that's been like for you and perhaps some of your fellow students? Uh, so as a student, it's impacted me in the ways that many of my classes may not be able to be had by anybody. So we've had to kind of try and band together for some of the smaller classes that may not have enough people to enroll in uh, outside of you know the facilities that the the campus gives us just let them know by you know calling them and saying hey we're, got, we're all going to take this class together and uh, just get on it because if we don't do that then the classes they just won't happen there have been other classes which just for me did not happen this semester in particular that has kind of set me back about at least six months if you know all goes well next semester uh, because they didn't have enough people enrolled in those courses in order to make them meet. Now, as working there, uh, I can certainly see the struggles that many of the students have uh, when, you know, our staff is enrolling them in perhaps the wrong courses, or, and, you know, that doesn't help them with them wanting to come back if they're taking a higher level course and 
having difficulties doing it. Uh, but conversely, because of the pandemic, when somebody has been enrolled in courses like that, that they may not supposed to be, be in, we can give them extra attention that they may not have had otherwise. Uh, not that that's the ideal situation, but we're trying to adapt as we go. Uh, but even then we're seeing quite a few people just fail to come back uh, after right. a single semester. Right, so that's paradoxical that with the declining enrollment that the slight silver lining is some folks are getting a little more attention but uh, still, the the um, you know the the hit to people's trajectories is very real. It sounds like falling right. away, not being able to get the courses they need. Um, so let's you know. So certainly, there's major problems. I'd like to turn to you, Lowell, and just say, you know, as a policy expert. Um, what ways have federal and state policies supported efforts to retain community college students and re-engage students who have fallen away? We've heard both Pam and JC talk about this, this huge problem. Um, and maybe add kind of what more needs to be done. Thank you for that question, Karen. I think it's a really important one. And since the start of the pandemic, there have been three uh, large scale federal investments um, to support mostly existing federally authorized education and training programs through Perkins CTE, through the Higher Education Act, uh, and through the Workforce Innovation and Opportunity Act. The first federal investment, um, which was passed in March of 2020, the CARES Act established an education stabilization fund, which included a a governor's um, emergency education relief fund, um, and it also included a higher education emergency relief fund. The governor's uh, reserve fund um, provided $2.9 billion in funding. The higher education fund provided $14 billion. Um, but since then, we've seen two additional pieces of legislation, the uh, Coronavirus Response and Relief Supplemental Appropriations Act in December of 2020, and um, most recently, the American Rescue Plan that passed about a year ago. And we've seen the states, you know, use this money for different things. So for example, Maryland um, is using about $10 million of their CARES Act funding um, from the governor's reserve to provide funding for community college workforce development to expand existing training and educational programs um, that are new and, and in demand um, post COVID. Texas is using a portion of their governor's reserve to maintain the state's uh, need-based financial aid programs to keep students enrolled in community colleges as, as well as their state universities. North Carolina is investing about $15 million into their community college system to provide tuition assistance um, for students enrolled in short-term workforce training programs that lead to an industry-recognized credential. Virginia um, is using almost $5 million um, for, uh, again, you know, uh, community college programs um, to address the financial needs of students providing some last dollar scholarship for displaced adults so that they can enroll in training programs that offer stackable credentials. And, and we've seen the same sort of investments at the local level. We heard a little bit from, from Pam, but you know, we've also seen uh, East Carolina uh, University in, in, in North Carolina, um, you know, obviously they're a four-year institution, but they're um, um, investing more in, in, in tutors and, and, and counseling. We've seen that in other, at other community colleges as well. Um, Chippewa Valley Technical College in Wisconsin is using some of their federal dollars um, under the Higher Education Fund to invest in open education resources to make textbooks, um, particularly in a nursing program, more affordable. And this is something that won't just benefit students during the pandemic, but certainly for, for years to come. Um, so, you know, it's it's been great that we've uh, that community colleges and, and, and um, state systems have had a massive influx of funding to address the um, you know, support needs of students as well as the training needs of students. And, and we know that community colleges are going to be even more critical to help build a healthy and inclusive economic recovery. Um, but it's really important to distinguish between relief and recovery. A lot of the funding that's come out so far has 
been intended to address the pressing needs of students. And that's why we've seen so many investments in tuition supports and things of that, that nature. Um, that does not necessarily make a re recovery. I think what we need to see in the future is more investments to build the capacity of community colleges, to work with employers, to work with industry, to design high quality education and training programs um, that provide youth and, and working adults a pathway to uh, high quality and, and family sustaining careers. Yeah. What I didn't hear you talk much about is getting the word out and marketing and re-engaging. <laughs> Um, so we, maybe we can talk about that a little bit more later. Um, but for the moment, Pam, I'd like to turn to you. Um, research shows that community college students who drop out of school for any period of time uh, are much less likely to graduate, to get, actually get a good degree uh, mm -hmm. than their peers who stay in school. So with what has your college been doing to tackle that issue? Have you had the bandwidth to deal with that? Um, and what role has CTE, if any, played in, in that role, in that issue? This is, this is not, this is the issue of persistence and retention um, has been one of the biggest barriers um, to, to completion of a degree and therefore to credentialing. And we do, I mean, that is really the key lever, right, to get folks into, into employment and sustainable employment that would allow them to grow. Um, we're seeing, I would not say dramatic, but certainly a, a noticeable drop in both retention and persistence from semester to semester and then from year to year, now that we've had a couple of years of COVID um, from our populations. We have done, everything that you can think of <laughs> I think under the sun. We have forgiven, um, we have forgiven debt um, on our books to encourage folks to come and um, re-engage with us. Um, if you are to sign up for classes this semester, we will forgive your debts prior to this in order to give folks a clean slate. And once students are with us, um, we're doing a great deal of wraparound tutoring. Um, we've moved into basic needs um, so that we have a food pantry now in case students are having those financial issues. And we are also dealing with things like homelessness and mental health. So if, if a student is disengaged, um, we do outreach. We called, oh God, the last time we did this, we called some 800 students to figure out why they're dropping out. And the causes are similar. It's money. It is children in the home, you know, that they have to take care of during COVID, all the things that you know, that keeps them from coming back. Um, there's a whole group of um, students that, who have some college, but no degree, because they have dropped out and have not re-engaged. And the National Student Clearinghouse research has shown that with that population, if we re-engage them, um, the likelihood is that at least half, if not more, of those students will succeed. So it's having the bandwidth to re-engage, right? So some of those care dollars um, that were mentioned um, actually went into that. And hopefully that becomes a strategy that we can keep up. But ultimately, though, the care dollars are nice, but they will be gone by 2024. So a more steady way of funding the community colleges and funding workforce development and CTE I think would pave the way into more success. Right, and I'm very interested in kind of the differential, um, the differences between ty types of, uh, you know, students dropping out and, and um, kind of falling off track. Uh, so maybe we can talk a little more about that. First, you know, Peter, I'd like to uh, reference something that Iris mentioned right at the top uh, about, research, a recent uh, working paper specifically found that community colleges that offered lots of hands-on technical programs suffered disproportionately large increase enrollment drops. Mm -hmm. yep. um, and you can see why um, a lot of those programs are hard to offer online or, you know, in amid COVID. Um, it also found that the enrollment declines in those programs explained much of why community colleges 
lost more male than female students during COVID. From what you've seen, I know you have a great perch looking across the sector. How are schools and employers responding to this challenge and why does it matter that they do so? So um, I, I think, you know, we certainly learned when COVID hit and, you know, it hit like a body blow to higher education across the spectrum. Um, some classes were a lot easier to transition to online than others, right? You can move a history class to online because by and large, you're talking about this week's readings and you can do it in a Zoom format, even if it's not perfect. Very hard to move an HVAC repair class where you're used to working in the shop, putting wires together, have an inspector, uh, an instructor look over your shoulder and kind of give you guidance. Very hard to put that online. One of the major investments we made when uh, it was clear COVID was going to be more than a, a two week adventure um, was to make several grants to community colleges, in, including Chippewa, which Lou mentioned earlier, um, to help them bring CTE courses online. Uh, one of the things I think we found is that while you, you can't you know, always replace the practice you get in the shop, there's an awful lot of work that can be done in the virtual reality space. And so we paid for developing um, various curricula uh, and modules that allow a student to wear those um, Oculus glasses and practice and learn the difference between this approach and that approach and the types of fittings that go together uh, and, and do it virtual reality wise before he gets into the shop. Uh, again, part of the decline was the fact that, you know, these courses, because they're in person, had to be more socially distanced, had to be uh, lower enrollment. It was more expensive to operate because you have to do a lot of cleaning afterwards uh, for safety purposes in the era of COVID. Um, and so you saw a tremendous decline in programs that are traditionally uh, attended by ma male students. So coming out of COVID, I would think that that enrollment will tick up, but I hope we've learned something that as Pam said, we can't go back to the same old, same old. We now can take some of these online modules, which students can learn at their own pace. So they don't have to be in school quite as often. Uh, that scheduling flexibility, I think it will be critical to bringing people back. Well, I'd like to turn now to JC, you know, just what Peter was talking about the issues of, you know, how, how you can operate hands-on kind of training uh, programs during COVID or not. Um, I, it can be a pretty poor fit um, for online learning. Virtual reality, that's fascinating. I've seen that operate with say medical students, but I haven't seen it in uh, HVAC training um, or manufacturing, advanced manufacturing. Um, so uh, tell me a little bit, JC, from your experience, how the rea those realities of, you know, what can be offered in person during COVID and, you know, what can be offered online? How did that play out for you and students that you work with? So uh, at our facility, when the initial wave of the pandemic hit and everything was shut down, uh, we were in a scramble to try and, you know, continue teaching. Uh, the class that I was in class at that point that was, you know, hands-on, I was learning to use uh, what's called an EDM machine. Uh, and that kind of got blown out of the window. There's no virtual training for that particular machine that we had access to. So all of our curricula just went straight to, uh, you know, book learning and theoretical knowledge, which has kind of impacted me negatively in the long run. Personally, I can't, since I still can't operate that machine with as much knowledge as I can the other machines in in our lab. But since then, there have been, uh, we do have access to simulators for some of our, for some of our machines, not all of them. The issue arises in that the simulators we have access to are not necessarily the same exact as the ones we use in class. So although they can understand, and they're incredibly draconian as far as like how you even use them, uh, they make things a bit more difficult than you would do in, in real life. But we have tried to push students into doing that online as much as they can so that when they come in, they can engage with the machines. Unfortunately, because a lot of this is all self-paced and online, many people neglect that uh, and in favor of coming in with the limited amount of time that we've had because as the pandemic hit, we cut our hours, our contact hours in the school and uh, had a greater emphasis on online learning. Uh, but many of the students did not do the online curriculum before 
coming in because they just came in and expected us to teach them as normal, uh, which has caused us to lag behind a little bit in what we were attempting to teach them in that semester. Uh, and it has caused us to change some curriculum for some of the upcoming classes as far as what's covered because it just wasn't covered during those periods of time when those students were taking those classes. Right. So just so much disruption and so yeah. much need to um, be flexible and uh, sounds like, you know, with some success, but also difficulties. Right. Um, yeah, so just pulling out a bit and going to more of a policy level, um, I, you know, in the news a lot, we've heard about the whole issue of free community college. That's been a big issue, uh, you know, politically. Um, I'd like to ask Lul, um, your what are your thoughts on the removal of free community college from the Biden administration's Build Back Better package? Um, and kind of a related development is that states are kind of having their own stepped up efforts uh, to offer free college. Do either of these developments affect uh, CTE in community colleges? And if so, um, how do you see that playing out? That's a great question, yeah. Caroline. And, and, and you know, the, the prospects of the Build Back Better Act, which passed the House of Representatives back in November, are unknown. But I think what seems pretty certain is that uh, the inclusion of free community colleges is not a priority, not even a scaled down version, um, you know, $45 billion two year, um, uh, or excuse me, $45 billion five year investment, which was included in the house version. Um, I don't know that that will necessarily take away from the momentum around free community college. However, I mean, this is something that started years ago at the local level. Um, there are about 350 college promise programs around the country, and there are 19 states that have some version of a, a college promise program. These programs tend to be last dollar scholarships, meaning that students need to exhaust Pell Grants and other sources of financial aid before they can take advantage of um, promise dollars. And, and what the research has shown is that, you know, waiving, um, you know, tuition at community college uh, not just increases in, in enrollment uh, for students who might not otherwise attend college, but it, it increases their, their wages. So it, it, it seems like a really promising um, intervention. And I think, uh, you know, even if it's not included in, in whatever federal bill passes next, um, that that won't take away from the movement. I do want to note, however, that there are some other significant higher education provisions in the Build Back Better Act. Um, for example, the uh, expansion of Pell Grants for low-income students and, and, and more money for college completion and career training programs. For instance, um, there's $1.2 billion for a TACT program, the Trade Adjustment Assistance Community College and career training program. This is something that was first introduced, uh, introduced in response to the Great Recession, um, and it provided funding to community college. And New America's own evaluation of the TAC program found that participants were twice as likely to complete a, a, a program and earn a credential and almost 30% more likely to have positive labor market outcomes than comparable students. Um, so it's really great that there is some interest in putting more money into an initiative uh, like that, um, money that can be used for childcare, for transportation, for advising and navigation services. A lot of the things that Pam uh, mentioned are really important for this, this student population. Um, there's an even larger community college uh, in, investment in, in the Build Back Better Act, a $5 billion program um, for community college and industry uh, partnerships. Um, uh, that would be administered by the Department of Education in coordination with the Department of Labor, TACT as a, a labor program. Um, and, and this too would provide some much needed resources um, to, again, build the capacity of community colleges. It takes time and resources to design high quality programs. And if we're talking about preparing for a post-pandemic econ economy, that planning and that collaboration needs to happen now. And, and, and so uh, really hopeful that Build Back Better will will um, uh, move forward and, and address some of the critical needs that community colleges and their students are facing. Yeah, that is really informative. Um, all the other ways that 
uh, money is flowing into the sector. So speaking of money, <laughs> Peter, I'd like to see uh, a little bit of your thoughts on or hear your thoughts on um, what philanthropy can do. You mentioned uh, an investment that you had had, but please tell us more about what you think the role of philanthropy is at this moment. Well, yeah, I, I think, you know, particularly in the absence of a national strategy on CTE, philanthropy can has a huge impact on systems change in this space. Um, you know, foundations need to be encouraged to um, fund things at the smack of risk or innovation. Um, you know, for my years in government, and uh, you know, I worked, I worked in uh, government, I worked uh, as a CFO of a major university system, public university system. I know from experience that anytime you, you, you do something a little innovative, a little bit different, um, that maybe isn't quite tested yet, uh, somebody somewhere is gonna come after you and tell you, you know, you're misusing government money or, you know, you, you, you didn't do good due diligence. One of the great things philanthropy can do is we can seed programs that might be a little bit new that nobody's really tried and see if they work and then to talk about ways to scale up. We have seeded a, a few programs like this and I couldn't be happier with the results um, where you know, we, we, we've particularly around helping um, young men who've recently been um, uh, released from the justice system who uh, need training, need jobs, uh, innovative programs that community colleges have put together with local unions in this space. Uh, so taking risk on innovation programs is just a great way for philanthropies to have outsized impact on driving innovation. Um, another good area is frankly, fund CTE programs with proven track records. You know, welding might not be sexy to a lot of people, but guess what? People who graduate from those programs get good jobs and they pay good wages, but they're not, a, not cheap to start up. That's one way that philanthropy can also start. And then thirdly, and I'd be curious on Pam's perspective on this, one of the things philanthropy can do is help the community college sector get better at data collection and storytelling. Uh, again, having worked in the higher education space for a long time and watched some of my private university peers who are so good at, at, at raising money, well, sometimes it's because they're just better at telling the impactful stories that excite foundation, impactful stories that excite individual donors. Um, community colleges need to do a better job at that. But to do it, sometimes you need to do a better job on data collection so you can tell the story in a meaningful way. Um, I'd love to see investments in that capacity building for our community college sector. Right. Well, um, thank you for that. And I, you know, I'd like to get into something that we talked about a little earlier about, um, you know, who, what people, in which kinds of programs are sticking with it during the pan, you know, the pandemic, and which maybe are falling away. Um, so, I, I guess I'd start with Pam and just. This issue of certificates versus degree granting programs, it, it seems like everyone wants a credential that doesn't take too long to earn, but still gets you a high paying job. Um, but what do we really know about the value of the CTE certificates um, and other micro credentials in, in landing students and good jobs? And, and have you seen any differences in the enrollment of people during the pandemic in kind of certificates versus degree programs. So that's that's a bunch of questions. I'm sorry, but <laughs> try to well, make sense it, of them. It, it's useful to sort of go down the string, right, and just to sort of name the the, the spectrum of of how you can learn at 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 an, at an institution. Let's start with non credit on my left hand side and credit credentials on my right hand side. In the old days. Uh, before COVID and all of these um, different tumultuous things happening. Um, the degree is the currency of the day. College credit is the currency of the day. And I can tell you, it still is the currency of the day because COVID will eventually go away or get normalized in some way, right? Now it's endemic and it soon will be, you know, some version of the flu or however folks want to see that recovery. Um, right now, non-credit credentialing, because it is shorter, and because it doesn't jump through the hoops of getting credit per se or popular, everybody and their brother-in-law are offering some small certification or some small micro-credentialing. And the colleges are too. We have a Cisco certification that is, I think three months, six months, it's short. Um, and we have things like CNA or, or um, certified nursing assistants. That's literally four classes and three days on site. 
right? And they're non-credit. But what we're trying to do is to build those non-credit things so that they're stackable, that eventually they'll stack into a cert, a, a cert those are certifications to stack into the next step, which is a certificate that's for credit. And certificates can built with different components into an associate degree, which then will build into a bachelor's degree or a master's degree and so on and so forth. Because we'd like to think that the person who comes and gets a six week or, or three month cert, um, certif uh, certification, uh, industry certification will eventually move along and get better and better credentialing for more and more advancement because they're, in, you know, and, and that's, that's, that's one way to keep students from being um, sort of locked into what I call the underclass CTE worker, right? You can only do coding and therefore you can't do anything else. And you didn't get any college credit for it, so you can't move to the next step. Right now, community colleges are trying to erase the lines between non-credit and credit. So there's a greater flowing of credentialing going up the ladder. Right. Uh -huh. So they're trying. How do you think that there's a lot of barriers to that? I mean, how how well do you think it's working? Um, I think because we're so desperate right now, every college is yeah. doing it. It's working better because if you can imagine you've been teaching in the credit area for ages and ages, let's say for 10 years and you're a professor and you're creating, you know, these wonderful sort of curriculum. Now there's the you know, the, the aggressive rascals on the other side saying, well, th these people have got the skills now validate them. I mean, there's a, right. there, there's a, what is the word? I hate to use this word, but there's a natural snobbery that goes on, right? That, that, that has gone on with CTE for a long time. This is not the first time that we've heard that word. Mm -hmm. Yet the kind of, the kind of skills that are being trained on a non-credit end, it's amazing. And they are earning 60, 70, $80,000 a year. So right. what we want to do is to have that be portable and allow folks even further growth and to change the field some more. Community colleges are poised for that because we are scrappy, right? We, 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 we say the heck with the snobbery. We need to get students in classes and in jobs. Um, now we just have to sort of bring the rest of the field along. Right, right. Well, I 100% uh, agree with everything that that Pam <laughs> mentioned. I'm in so much I, trouble. <laughs> no, I mean, I, I think it's I think it's great, and and short term programs certainly have value. But I think it's important to um, really examine who they are valuable for. They're not all created equal, and the reality of the situation is women and people of color and immigrants do not see the same you know, sort of positive boost in participating in short-term programs alone that aren't stackable as, as, as Pam mentioned as um, other groups. Um, I last year did some analysis based on training, uh, short-term training data from Washington State. Um, and what it revealed is that, you know, men and women enroll in short-term training, training at um, comparable levels, but they enroll in different programs and it mirrors uh, the, occupational gender segregation that we see in our our labor market. I mean, short term programs tend to have higher completion rates and they're more affordable. So they're they're attractive, right, especially now, um, given our economy. But the, the value of a program can't, you know, solely be assessed um, uh, by those measures. You really have to look at the labor market outcomes of of graduates. And, um, you know, while short term graduates might be earning you know, more than the hourly minimum wage in, in a region, it doesn't necessarily mean that they're earning a living wage. And again, this is um, disproportionately impacting uh, women, women of color who tend to be overrepresented in programs uh, in healthcare and, and in education. Um, and, and so that's really important to, to keep in, in mind, like what are the labor market conditions that um, these program graduates are, are finding themselves in. It also really speaks to the importance of labor policies that ensure a living wage for these in-demand occupations. We, you know, our population is aging. We will always need CNAs and home health workers, um, but, you know, it's, it's not enough to just get people into these jobs. We have to create career pathways, as, as Pam mentioned, and we really have to make sure that the initial jobs that they end up in are, are providing them family sustaining uh, benefits. Right, thank you for that. I, I do wanna move on to some audience questions in a minute. Um, so if you have them, please put them in. Um, we have 
we want to we won't get to all of them at all but i will maybe get to some of them and before we do that i just want to ask one more myself um to and this is for you uh jc i really would love to hear from the student perspective you know what helps or hinders students from staying enrolled and on track in a community college CTE program, you know, and, and maybe you can share a little bit about what has motivated you just, you know, to persist despite setbacks and challenges. So, you know, just your take on that a little bit. So I, I know for some students, they're just incredibly driven, right? So they, they would do this regardless of whether or not anybody told them to, but for a lot of them, uh, they fall off, I think anyway, some of them I know fall off because of difficulties with outside forces or with the enroll the uh, enrollment uh, in certain courses being an issue. There's one student right now who's having an issue with um, uh, with getting funding to pay for the courses and one of the grants or that is helping him like didn't work. I'm not entirely certain what's going on, but we're trying to work him through that. And we're just it's uh, so he may not come back, but he's, I think, three courses in uh, others. They just they get enrolled in this course. They try it for a bit and then they just leave uh, myself. The thing like that keeps me going is just I'm very close to being done. Uh, and I mean, uh, speaking of certifications versus associates like degree plans, our our, our uh, counseling staff tends to push the associates degrees over certifications. And I can tell you right now, I have all of the courses done in the certification, but not for the associates. And the only thing holding me up is associates classes. So, uh, but just keeping going because I have almost none left is not something that is applicable to everybody. And um, just the thing that I, I, I try to make it an environment that people will want to come back to uh, so that they can continue learning and, you know, and sometimes that works. There are a few students I'm actually pretty good friends with, and we play games and watch movies and stuff every now and then. Uh, but I mean, I'm, I'm one person and, oh boy, some of the staff just uh, make it very difficult to want to come back the next semester and continue to, to pursue their, their career. Is that because of um, advising or being tough in grading or no? Just uh, some of the some of the staff can their their courses are a little bit difficult in the sense that uh, they can really cause students to not really feel like it's worth their time mm. uh, for one reason or another. Specifically, mm. whether or not they're actually learning what they need to learn. Mm. Uh, so, but. Outside of that, like things outside of my control, we just try to, you know, uh, create a small community and hopefully anybody who stays around will be able to look out for each other at the end of the day. We'll bolster each other. Yeah. Well, thank you for that. Well, let's get, let's turn to a uh, question we have from the audience. Um, while breaking down the CTE stigma, how do we also work against the tracking that black communities have experienced in the past and are concerned about? Um, I think that's a really, I, I, I'd invite Peter maybe to jump in on that. I know it's something you've written about and I'd really love to hear Pam specifically your take and any, you know, Lul or uh, JC well, think, also, but Peter, yeah, it'd be great Pam, to uh, Pam put in some comments that are, that are very useful uh, to consider uh, stackable credentials, ensuring uh, students are getting college credit, similar to our comments from a few minutes ago. Um, but I think, you know, part of it, look, the rest of the world doesn't look at CTE this way. In Europe, it, it's perfectly appropriate and even commendable to pursue a CTE career vis-a-vis -vis that of a, of a university education. And it's, it's really kind of, in some ways, only this country where we have pushed people away from that track. I think it's really important early in a young person's educational journey, and I'm talking middle school and high school, to help them understand what all the various pathways are. And that the pathways are really in many ways equal to each other in terms of value and the, the contributions you can make back to your community. And so changing that stigma in people's minds is really critically important uh, from the get-go, I think. Pam, do you wanna jump in there at all? Oh, no, I, I, yeah, I feel I, like you covered Peter, it. Peter's got it. Peter's got it. Oh, I, 
I can agree. I kind of see this educational like stratis stratification happening. There's so many students who just don't know about our program or aren't interested and think, you know, they're going to do college stuff and get the degree plans and it'll work out. They don't necessarily have an idea of, hey, there's these other jobs, you know, that in fact, if you get into them and work your way up, they pay as much, if not more than some of these, you know, less these other degree plans that are more standard. Yeah. You know, and the other thing I will say, and I, I'm going to try not hard not to get off topic here, Caroline, but you know, I was a trustee in the four-year space at major university system for many years, a CFO at a research university. With all due respect, there's some tracking in the four-year space as well, where a lot of kids of color are encouraged to take those majors that don't lead to higher paying jobs. For whatever it's worth, STEM jobs pay more. And there's tons of data to show whether it be engineering, nursing, uh, computer science, you get much better high and paying jobs there. And yet many of our students are encouraged to go other routes. And you know, until we also address that inequity and that kind of tracking, we're not going to fully solve this problem. Right. So it's not just uh, in CTE and community yeah. colleges. That's a really good point. Um, okay. I have another question from a um, audience member. What are good examples of programs that leverage the workforce ready learning that CTE provides, but also offer a path to a four year transfer for higher wages? That's almost sounds, you know, that's it's very difficult to pull that off. Um, anybody have any uh, examples of that for the audience? Yeah, I can, I can chime in first. I mean, I think we're seeing a lot of interest and momentum around college connected and degree apprenticeships. Um, so these are earn and learn models uh, where students are employees from day one, they're partnered with an employer, they're earning a wage, but they're also learning uh, in the classroom theoretical knowledge that's important for them to perform their job. And community colleges play a really important role in College Connected and degree apprenticeships, providing the related classroom in, in instruction. And um, I think part of the reason why this is emerging as a, a really promising practice is, in addition to providing hands-on learning, which we know is, is, is really enriching, um, these tend to be affordable um, because oftentimes employers are paying for the post-secondary learning um, and they're equipping individuals with the skills and the credentials. Um, so industry recognized credentials as, as, as well as um, post-secondary certificates and degrees that are needed to succeed in the labor market and not just in the traditional skills trades, but in IT, and in um, financial services, in healthcare, advanced manufacturing. This is one model that the federal government has been investing significantly into. They just announced a grant opportunity last week um, that could go to community college as well as other uh, training uh, pro providers um, because it, it kind of makes sense for all the users involved for uh, post-secondary institutions, for employers, and, and for workers and, and learners. Yeah. I can speak to that somewhat. We have several apprenticeship programs within our uh, purview uh, with different manufacturers in the area. And it do well, it doesn't happen all the time. Some of those opportunities, they lead to further education when, say, they complete the apprenticeship training and then they want to boost them to a different you know, sector. There are a couple of people I'm in contact with who are now going to four-year uh, degree plans in order to you know, work for a company who wants them to have that skill set. Great. And, and, you know, I, I think the the transfer to to the bachelor's degree or I'll call it bachelor's completion has been given really unfair press in that if you're going to work in any capacity at all beyond entry level um, in any trade or any profession or to be in management as you as you get you know more mature and <laughs> like those of us who are older in years, you need a bachelor's degree. Because you're supervising, you know, you're supervising departments, you're, you're, you're doing business plans, and those are not necessarily the skills that you would earn in, in a, in a, in a six-month um, entry-level certificate. So I, I, I think in any field at all, um, the, the ability to move on to bachelor's is, is a requirement now. I, I don't necessarily think that is, you know, that, that it is an option in that way. Um, about the apprenticeships, um, the, uh, the Biden administration through the Department of Labor has just revived the advisory committee for apprenticeships, and we are working 
on four or five recommendations that will bring apprenticeships into the contemporary age. Um, we have wonderful track records with our trades, but we need to work on diversification of our um, human resource. We need to be much better in the DEI area. And then with emerging industries like clean energy, um, like the um, business and other professionals, uh, professional fields that apprenticeship is just not seen as a, uh, an instrument, but they should be. That's what internships are. Yeah. People are calling them different things because they have certain ideas about what sounds better or what's more elite, right? Well, internships are apprenticeships. Yeah. <laughs> They're not different. So I, I think the field needs that adjustment to really understand that we're not all different pieces and silos. It is all one system. And our work is to really make that system seamless. I look at Germany, actually Germany looks at us and they go, what are you people doing? <laughs> I have really interesting conversations with the German um, council general. And she's like, we, we wanna come and work on your apprenticeships. I'm like, you have apprenticeships. We need to learn from you. Um, it, it, we're in a very strange time, I think in higher education, uh, but it's a good shaking out, right? This is what is needed. It's this, time. This is exciting about your, this is, are one of these recommendations coming out? This, okay, there is this advisory a, committee. a preliminary report in April, and it's a two year stint on this advisory. So about a year or so after that will be final recommendations. Okay. And they are everything from figuring out how it can be easier for employers to get apprentices, because right now you have to climb very steep mountains um, and, and where the focus needs to be, which is not so much um, the fields themselves, because every field needs one, but how to get our, how to support our employers in applying for these things. Right. Well, I have a question in here, but uh, from a distinguished EWA member, um, from uh, Colorado. And so I have to ask that because we're really coming up on time um, from our journalist member here. Um, what are innovations in course offerings, micro credentials, short skills courses, et cetera, to encourage students to come back and give them what they need? Anybody want to tackle that in the few minutes that we have remaining? We've I know we've touched on that somewhat. But. I'll offer two ideas. Great. And I think, uh, you know, we funded a program through St. Clair Community College in Ohio that was looking to try to figure out how to bring students back and how to compete with for-profits that are just much better at marketing. And I think they did a number of, of focus groups with students and they found two things really drive the issue. Scheduling for flexibility and yes. promises of fast completion. Um, right. And they really designed a program uh, that's engaging adults to graduate leveraging efficiencies, EGLE. And yes. that EGLE program is all about focusing on scheduling flexibility and fast track to completion, and it's having great success. So uh, if your member is interested in looking, for example, Sinclair Community College in Ohio. Yeah, that's great. And, oh, go ahead, Pam. I was gonna say, and then you pay them because their mm. skin in the game is not to work so they can come to you. So you need to sort of backfill their paycheck and then give them a transportation stipend. They're gonna, they knock on your door. I ran out of money doing that. So. <laughs> I was just going to add, this is actually a topic that New America is doing some research on looking at six community colleges that are implementing strategies to bring students back. And some of the things that they're exploring is looking at registration holds, re-examining their marketing efforts and how they're designing programs to make them really attractive um, to, to adult learners. So it's something that um, we'll be sharing more about in the coming months. That's good. I can certainly say that the, uh, the students who are in the internship or apprenticeship programs almost never miss because they are literally being paid to be there and it is their job. Whereas the others, they have to work around schedules and we have to be as accommodating as we can, but occasionally that just can't happen. Well, I'm, I'm going to give you the last word then because I think we are out of time. Thank you all so much. Thank you to the audience for coming with all those great questions. I wish we could have gotten to more. Um, and I, that's it. Thank you very much for coming to our webinar.